John Smith will pinch hit in the bottom of the ninth inning. Dogs and X's battling for the Central Division lead, tied at four. John, second on the club with nine home runs. Ready on lefty, the 2-2 is swung on and John Clobbers one. It's high and deep to right. It's way back there and it's gone. A pinch hit walk off home run for John Smith. Oh baby. And the Salt Dogs have won it five to four. All right, so good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sam Bennett. I've had a rather remarkable, possibly unhealthy, obsession with the topic of independent baseball since pretty much my high school years is when the obsession started, but um, I've known about it for most of my entire life. Um, and all of this culminated in a 45-minute documentary that I made on the subject in the fall of 2016. Uh, for this documentary, I traveled to both Lincoln, Nebraska and St. Paul, Minnesota. One of those was longer than the other. Um, and I read as much as I could find. I researched as much as I could research. Um, and so hopefully through all this, I could be considered something of an authority on the subject. I suppose we'll put that to the test today. Um, what is the best thing about independent baseball? What's the one, the best thing about minor, are they independent? Yeah. Uh, not having to answer to a, an organization. We couldn't get away with a lot of the promotions we do in affiliated ball, because you're always worried about you're representing the major league ball club to me, you know, telling me who's going to manage here, who's the manager I'm going to work with, where here I go out and I can, I go ahead and I hire my manager and that's, I, we create that working relationship and figure out what or how we're going to do that um, each and every day. That's the flexibility that's, that I love anyway about what we do. Less rules, you know, I mean, it really is when you sit in an owner's meeting it's all right there and we talk about these things. Sometimes we don't do them, but there's a real power at the, at the independent level to change things and be different and, and try stuff. Um, I would say first is the promotions and also second would be customer service. Um, we provide, that's one of the heaviest things that we rely on here in St. Paul, I should say at least, um, is customer service and treating the fan like they're the only person in the ballpark. If I worked for a single A or double A club, we may not have the same flexibility to do things because that final, that final answer, if I, if I need an answer, it may come from my internal office or it might have to go up the ladder, you know, because there's an ownership group that's going to be looking after, after their investment and rightfully so. I like it because the guys are hungry. You know, uh, you know I, had a, I worked in hockey for 18 years and had that great experience of guys wanting to get to that next level. You know, the guys that play here, are they desire to continue their career for that dream. We don't have to answer to anyone here. We have the freedom to do what we want, to poke fun at what I mean, the Saints have poked fun at the, at the commissioner, uh, not the newest one, not, not Rob Manfred, but um, Bud Selig on a number of occasions. If you were an affiliated club, there's no way you could do that. So. I mean, the, the organization level is, you know, from a league standpoint, is super flat. You know, it's just, it's, tw in our case, 12 guys in a room deciding what they want to do and try and all that, and, and stuff changes from, you know, the international extra innings rule, you know, exhibit A of, you know, being able to try stuff and, and try, to, try to figure out from a, 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 a baseball standpoint, but also from a marketing standpoint, what works. Um, today I'll go over what the independent leagues are, where they are, how they came about, and what has made them successful, and last for as long as they have. I'll also briefly outline my personal journey through making this documentary, how it helped me as a filmmaker, and what I took away from it. So we'll go ahead and uh, skip over the slide that had a video. So what is independent baseball? Let's have a quick definition of it. Um, what? Basically, independent baseball 
is baseball leagues and teams that exist outside of the regular baseball hierarchy. So you have the major leagues, you have their minor leagues, and all of their affiliates, affiliates that run down from the AAA level through the rookie league level. Independent baseball exists outside of that. They are not tied to any major league organization or team. They don't feed their players to any one specific team. They sign their own player, players, they pay for them. They are literally independent. Uh, we'll also go over where they are. Yes, here we go. Why? And then we'll also talk about stuff about me. So the origins of the independent leagues, since you know about them, uh, they were started in 1993 when the Northern League and the Frontier League were started. The Northern League was started by Miles Wolf, who was the editor of the magazine Baseball America at the time, and he started the Northern League. And the Frontier League was started simply by some businessmen. And so these were the original two, and they have lasted until now. The Northern League is now known as the American Association, but the Frontier League still exists today. Um, and they are both very, very successful. Uh, and since then, numerous leagues and teams have come, and some of them have gone. Some of them, like the North American League, for instance, uh, were wide-ranging in their teams' locations, at one point having teams in places like Calgary and Alberta, Canada, and Brownsville, Texas. You can imagine the travel budget. That league did not last long. Uh, but other leagues, like the South Coast League, though it was all, all, only around for one year, was concentrated in the Southeast. Um, and so other leagues have been very regional. Of the leagues that exist today, there are main four that have been around and stood the test of time. These leagues created a sort of loose alliance to be sure to preserve their success. Uh, the rest are younger leagues trying to prove themselves. So let's go over them. As I run down the list, we'll go through it in order of level of competition in those leagues. So firstly, we have the Atlantic League. Uh, which has teams in the Northeast and Texas, which that story is one in and of itself. The, Texas, the team that's in Texas um, was actually going to join a different league, but at the last second switched to the Atlantic League. So now all the teams that come to play in that to Texas have to fly there, which has got to be kind of uh, inconvenient. Uh, next is the American Association, which lo is located mainly in the upper Midwest. Um, there's a team here in Nebraska. There's one in Iowa, South Dakota, North Dakota, Manitoba, Minnesota. Uh, Kansas, and then three teams down in Texas. Uh, then there's the Can-Am League, which has teams in the Northeast, Ontario, and Quebec. The Frontier League, which is mainly in the sort of Great Plains region, but also goes sort of south. They have a team in Kentucky as well. Um, now, then there's the Pacific Association, which has all of its teams located generally in the San Francisco Bay Area. There's the Pecos League, which is located in, from California through Kansas. They have teams all over. Then the United Shore League, which is located only in suburban Detroit. All of their teams play in the same stadium. Um, yep. <laughs> and then the Empire League, which has teams in New York and Maine. So with all these teams, let's talk about the players in them. And with a sport such as baseball, which attracts players from many walks of life, there are all sorts of ethnicities and nationalities for the players that play in the independents. Overall, the overall diversity of a specific team relies mostly on the manager of that team and what connections he has. For instance, the Sonoma Stompers, which are in the Pacific Association, regularly have three to four Japanese players because their manager is Japanese. Um, Gabe Suarez, who is a manager in the American Association, he manages the Cleburne Railroaders, but has managed other teams in the past, regularly signs Cuban defectors, and so he has one of the most diverse teams. Uh, the Lincoln Salt Dogs, coming a bit closer to home, currently have four Dutch players on their roster, uh, and just sold one of their other ones, uh, sold his contract to uh, the Baltimore Orioles. Um, However, from my research, independent teams will, by and large, have rosters skewed more toward American players. In the American Association, the team that last year had the best record, the St. Paul Saints, had a roster entirely of American players. Um, two years ago, they had one foreign player, and he was from South Africa. The reason for this is, in some cases, some teams just don't like to deal with possible visa issues, especially if they're in a league that will travel to Canada. That can add more time that you're sitting at the border or even add some cost to it. And for some teams, that's not worth it. For some teams, it's not a problem. But some teams like to avoid it in general. Now, with as diverse as the players can be, uh, their paths to the independent leagues can be just as diverse. For most players, independent baseball is second chance baseball. They got signed by a major league team. They were released for one reason or another. And now they're coming to the independents to try to get their second chance to get back to the major leagues. For others, it's first chance baseball. They were overlooked coming out of college, 
and they, so they go to play in the independence to prove their worth. I'll share a few of my favorite stories from players I got to see over the summer when I worked in independent baseball. And they, their stories, as I said, are wide ranging. Firstly, we have Dalton Wheat. Dalton Wheat went to NCAA Division II school in Poria State in Kansas. Uh, and upon graduating, he signed with the Kansas City T-Bones of the American Association. In 67 games with the T-Bones, he hit 335. And after the season, he had his contract purchased by the Miami Marlins. And the best thing about him is that he doesn't actually use batting gloves. If you look here, he's wearing work gloves, the type that you would buy at Home Depot or Menards. He doesn't use standard batting gloves, and it's something he said that he has just always done. It's the quirkiness of that that is something that you find in the independent leagues that you wouldn't find anywhere else. Currently, he's playing for the single-A team for the Miami Marlins, and yes, he still does wear those gloves. Next, we have Mark Hamburger. He was a former major league pitcher, but he was released by the Texas Rangers after being assessed a drug suspension. He now plays for St. Paul, where after being a reliever his whole major league career, he's a starter. He went 12 and 6 in 2016, and he's known as the mayor of St. Paul. He's originally from there. He often rides his skateboard to the stadium, and has also told the St. Paul Saints that he ref to refuse any attempt by a major league team to purchase his contract unless they promise that he can be a starter when he gets to their organization. He spent this past winter playing in Australia for the Melbourne Aces and is actually credited with possibly having helped save the Australian Baseball League with the uh, personality he brought to it. Next, we have a, team, a player that played for the Lincoln Salt Dogs, Lindsey Coggle. He was a single-A pitcher in the Dodgers system, but they cut him after he missed all but one game of the 2015 season. He signed with Lincoln and ended up leading the league in ERA among starters, pitching against teams that had far better offenses than you would find where he was in the low A, in the low a leagues. He ended up getting purchased by the Seattle Mariners, and he's now pitching for their double-A team. And finally, we have my personal favorite, Dan Johnson. He was a longtime major league hitter who actually, for the record, went to the University of Nebraska. But he came to the independence after his hitting career stall stalled to become a knuckleball pitcher, who also moonlighted occasionally as a designated hitter. Uh, this summer, I got to see him start a game and throw seven shutout innings, and then come out the next night and hit two home runs. He's currently pitching in the Dodgers organization. So now that we've talked about the players, let's get to the million dollar question. How much do teams pay their players? And perhaps it's more of a $100,000 question or $75,000 question. Nearly every league has a salary cap. In the Atlantic League, it's $55,000 per month that a team can pay its players. In the American Association, it's $100,000 for a year. In the Frontier League, it's $75,000 for a year. And as you go down, the numbers will decrease. Uh, each team also has minimum and month, ma maximum monthly salaries. In the Atlantic League, a player can be played as low as $650, but as much as $350, $3,000, excuse me, per month, although that's, that's a claim that is somewhat disputed. Um, in the American Association, a, the minimum salary is $800 per month, but there is no maximum. You could pay a player whatever you want. And finally, in the Frontier League, the minimum that a player can make is $600, and the maximum is $1,600, although that is rarely a number that is actually used. Obviously, players are, players are not getting paid much, but that is the standard throughout minor league affiliated baseball as well. When you're in the minor leagues, you're not getting paid all that much to play baseball. You're pretty much doing it for the love, especially at the independent level. Another similarity between the independents and minor leagues are the business side of things. Uh, the only difference between minor league and the higher level of independence and affiliated minor leagues is the fact that independent teams have to pay their own players. Otherwise, they run exactly like minor league baseball with very few exceptions. Those who are in the industry will vehemently make the point that it is run exactly the same as a triple A or double A team. They're very passionate about that. Uh, sticking with business, the franchises are also fairly volatile. Far more independent teams have failed than are successful. To date, a total of five teams closed up shop after the 2016 season. However, eight teams are starting up for the 2017 season. This is across all leagues. And there's already an, an entirely new league announced for the 2018 season. Now, succeeding in the independents can be very difficult. One of the teams that folded this past fall was the Joplin Blasters of the American Association. The team failed after two seasons because they couldn't get anyone to, the co to come to the ballpark. They were owned by a baseball agent and his two sons. They had only dealt with baseball on the player side of things. They actually had no idea how to run a team from the business side of things, but they thought they'd give it a shot. 
Uh, they fielded a competitive team in the first year, but they learned very quickly that baseball alone wasn't going to bring the attendance they needed to stay afloat. They averaged 1,545 attendees in their first season after being projected to average over 3,000. And they only averaged 646 in their second. That's almost a third of what they had in their first season. They failed to become a part of the city. They failed to successfully market their team. And instead, they actually became something of an enemy to the city, as the team and the city ultimately ended up suing each other after this past season. That was settled out of court. <laughs> So what does make a baseball team successful? When a team first comes about, there will be fairly high attendance due to the novelty of the team. But one way to get fans to keep coming back is through promotions. This is also where I had a video, but uh, I can't play it. Um, as those in the industry will tell you, uh, a benefit of the independent leagues is that they don't have a parent organization, which means you essentially don't have Big Brother looking over your shoulder. So you can pretty much do whatever you want. And a fantastic, fantastic example of this is the St. Saint Paul Saints, who are one of the teams I focused on in my documentary. They had, they've had pretty out there promotions, like, um, for instance, they've had Michael Vick Dog Chew Toy Night. <laughs> um, and another one that they do is, so almost every single minor league team across the country has a night that's called Faith and Family Night, where they invite local churches to come out, and sometimes they'll have a church service before the game. Uh, and the St. Paul Saints do that. They actually do that for several denominations. But they also partnered with Minnesota Atheists, and they had a game where they changed their name from the St. Paul Saints to the Mr. Paul Aints. <laughs> They're pretty much willing to do whatever they can to get people out, out to the ballpark. And that's actually pretty typical when you consider who they're owned by. They're owned by Mike Veck and Bill Murray. That's the real Bill Murray. Um, <laughs> And Mike Veck, who is the son of Bill Veck, who is one of the most eccentric owners in the history of Major League Baseball, who he owned, I believe, at least three teams and was <laughs> responsible for some of the out most outrageous promotions, such as having a little person come to bat as a pinch hitter. His number on the back of his jersey was a fraction. Um, <laughs> and also, also the infamous disco demolition night. Um, so... But another thing they do is they become ingrained in the community. They do so many community outreach programs. Um, they send their players out to schools. They've basically become a vital part of St. Paul. Their new downtown ballpark is just right there among everything else. They are one of the most prominent things on the Visit St. Paul website. And this is a reason why they've been so successful uh, since 1993. Uh, the clip that I have here uh, had some Saints personnel talking about some of their favorite promotions that they've run. I'll, I'll go ahead and just tell you about them. Um, this first person, uh, Sierra, she's their head of promotions. Uh, in the past couple seasons, the Saints have actually broken two Guinness World Records. Uh, the first one was, spo the, was sponsored by the company MyPillow, and they had the world's biggest pillow fight. So everyone in attendance was given a pillow, and in between the fifth and sixth innings, everyone just had a massive pillow fight. Um, another one that they do is uh, they had what was called the darkness to light game and that was a game that started at four in the morning. For this one they actually partnered with a group that helped with uh, previously abused children. It's called from darkness to light and so they said what can we do with that. So they started a game that started in darkness and then ended in the light. Um, and what they did for this one, they had a rooster sitting on top of one of the dugouts and they had it mic'd up and as soon as the sun came over the horizon the rooster actually went off, <laughs> for lack of a better term, um, which I think is just an amazing story. Uh, and finally, one thing that they also do that's different is, um, so teams will typically have bat boys or bat girls that run out and retrieve the bat um, after a player has hit the ball and gotten out or gotten a hit. They have a, they have a pig. <laughs> they have a pig that... Uh, uh, helps to it also helps bring out the balls to the umpires. That's something that has been done a couple times with dogs, but no, they use a pig, which has actually led to their physical, like big fuzzy mascot being an actual pig as well. So one year, they had a pig roast, <laughs> but they didn't tell anyone what it was. What it actually was was like a Comedy Central type roast. They were they were brought in comedians to just say mean things about the pig, <laughs> but they didn't tell anyone that. They didn't disabuse anyone of that knowledge. And in fact, as, pe as people came into the ballpark, they actually gave them those little packets with like s plastic silverware and a napkin. Um, they had a picket line out front for that one. <laughs> but it got people interested, and that's what they're all about. 
so moving on now to a bit of a personal side of thing, personal side of things. This documentary was really a journey both for me as a filmmaker and as a person. As a filmmaker, it pushed me in new ways in terms of video editing and design. I spent countless hours just in the Gray Center, um, banging my head against a desk, <laughs> uh, trying to get this done. Um, and I had to do many things I hadn't before, and I had to teach myself how to do things, and I had to apply everything that I'd learned up to that point here at Hastings College to try to make this. Uh, so I had to do editing, and I, it, it was a big thing for storytelling for me as well. I'd only worked on uh, fictional videos, on pieces of fiction before. Um, and so being a sort of documentary storyteller was another uh, side of it. It also gave me a new appreciation for baseball, specifically independent baseball, to the point where I've actually become more obsessed with independent baseball than I have with Major League Baseball, which is saying something. It's saying a major thing. I actually couldn't tell you who the Dodgers are playing tonight, but I could tell you who the Sioux City Explorers signed last weekend. <laughs> it was Alex White, former Colorado Rocky, for the record. Um, and I grew as a person. Honestly, it was really, as cheesy as this sounds, it was liberating and sort of fulfilling to be able to do this on my own. I was a one-man crew. I traveled to St. Paul and Lincoln by myself. I carried all the equipment myself. I interviewed everyone myself. And it would have been fantastic to have other people work with me on this one in terms of the creative side. But it was also, I think, it became important to me that I was able to do it all on my own. And so I'm very thankful for that. Uh, so before I conclude here, I'd like to thank uh, my... Uh, advisor for this, Chad Power, who without whose guidance I might not have started making videos in general. Um, I'd also like to thank Dr. Rob Badcock who lent me some literature it, during the pre-production process that proved to be very helpful, especially when I went up to St. Paul. I promise I'll return those books. Um, uh, the way I was going to conclude this is I, one of the things I did when interviewing everyone for this was at the end I asked them what the best thing about independent baseball is, and I was going to show that, but ultimately I think I'll share what's best about it for me. Um, independent baseball for me is one of the ultimate underdog stories in sports because you have people, it's a league of rejects or multiple leagues of rejects, either people who <coughs> became unwanted by major league clubs or who were never wanted in the first place, but they are wor working to strive on the periphery of the national pastime to try to make it in the sport that they love. And I think that's absolutely poetic and fantastic. Um, and so, and it actually sort of makes independent baseball a bit more, I suppose, romantic for me than, than affiliated baseball, which is why I wanted to do my documentary on this. So thank you very much. And I, I guess I'll open it to questions if that's a thing. <laughs> Uh, they came, most of them come here to play. Um, and the story with them is actually much the same as the American players. They're rejects from their own, co from their own leagues in their countries. Um, Japan has their own major league and minor league, which is a lot smaller than um, America's. But they also have their own independent leagues. So some of the players from the Japanese independent leagues will also come here. Um, it's sort of the same thing. Uh, some Dutch players will just come straight here and play independent baseball. A lot of Cuban guys, when Cuban players defect, they have the opportunity to sign with major league clubs. But if they don't, then they have to play independent baseball, which was what one of the case was. It was the case with one player I saw uh, this past year, but I could see why he wasn't signed. <laughs> In 40 games, he didn't take a single walk. Like his, like his, he'd swing literally at anything from his ankles to his shoulders. So <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> yes. Did you stumble across any uh, unique names that you've seen, or any oh. uh, logos or cultures? Yeah. So that's actually, I could do a whole other academic showcase day presentation on minor league team names. Um, minor league baseball has some of the most weird and intriguing names out there. In affiliated baseball, 
Uh, some of the team, cha team name changes that happened this past year, there's a team called the Binghamton Rumble Ponies. There's the Jacksonville Jumbo Shrimp. There's the New Orleans Baby Cakes. <laughs> that was just in this past year. There have been more, like the Lehigh Valley Iron Pigs. Um, <laughs> but what those teams have figured out is that if you change your name to something outrageous and eye-catching like that, it does make a difference. People will suddenly want to have that merchandise, merchandise either because they think it's cool or cute or something, or because they think it's weird. One of the things, so the New Orleans in particular, the, they used to be called the Zephyrs, and no one really cared. But then they changed the name to the Baby Cakes, and it was on the news, and suddenly people knew about them and wanted to come to their games and wanted to buy their merchandise. And not only does it get you a fortune in merchandise, it also drums up local interest. Um, some of the names in the independents, so some, a trend that I sort of notice is um, if you take a noun or adjective and put it in front of an animal, so if you, ha you have teams like the Lincoln Salt Dogs or the Gary Railcats, um, there, are all sorts of <laughs> there are all sorts of names out there. Uh, personal favorite is the Sioux Falls Canaries. I just like that one. The Laredo Lemurs, there are always points for alliteration as well. Um, but yeah, the names, the names are pretty, pretty out there and they're all over. Oh. So, first two parts. Max Scherzer. Max Scherzer. Uh, Luke Hochaver. Um, well, and those are sort of technicalities. Um, for them, they became high draft picks. Their, their agent is Scott Boris, if anyone knows who Scott Boris is. Um, he's the, like the most intense baseball agent. And for a while there, they, they have since changed the rules. Um, but for a while there, basically, when he was uh, the agent of a player about to be drafted, if they didn't like the offer they got from a major league team, they would just say, all right, we're going to go play independent ball and re-enter the draft next year, which is the case with Max Scherzer and Luke Hochaver. Um, as far as other players that, um, for instance, were in the minor leagues, went down, then came back up, that weren't there from the start, uh, the Milwaukee Brewers opening day starter, Javi Guerra, he actually used to play for Lincoln, um, there was uh, John Holtzcomb who made headlines a couple weeks ago, be not a couple, a couple years ago, because he started out the season in independent baseball and ended up ending it with the Pirates pitching in the postseason in the major leagues. Um, and those stories tend to happen every single year. There are quite a few guys. I think uh, some of the guys I talked about, you'll, they'll end up being like those guys who make it to the majors, and I think that's probably something to watch for, but quite a few of them. Mm -hmm. Is there, is there anyone who sort of There have been quite a few. Uh, there was one who, his name was um, Brian Garner. He played for Lincoln for 10 straight years, each year hitting like 350 with 20 home runs. Never had his contract purchase or anything like that. And a lot of guys grind it out um, for that long, but I think with the way that things are now, like a lot of these teams have, a lot of these leagues have roster rules, like you can only carry so many veterans on your team, which I think sort of brings the chances of that down. Another one of those is Chris Regis, um, who pitched for Sioux Falls this past year. He's been playing in the Independence since 2002. I think since then, he has spent, I think, a year and a half in affiliated baseball. Did well, still got released. Um, he's a left-handed pitcher who is also um, teaches at Minnesota Mankato, math. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, he's in his. He's entering his age 37 season as uh, like a closer. He's typically one of the best closers in the league or starter, whatever you have him do. Um, there, there are quite a few of those. And you'll find that also in the Atlantic League because they're allowed to go for longer because they don't have roster rules as well. Oh. <laughs> uh, how does the competition compare to the international independent leagues and the major leagues in uh, Japan? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, there's a lot of difference in co level of competition in the independent leagues themselves in here in America. Um, and so when I was running through them, 
there have been there like the estimation will vary on what like the equivalent is um, for the independent leagues. Like for instance, the Atlantic League. Um, this is sort of based on my estimation and what other people have said. I think like the Atlantic League, you'll have a lot of former major league players in there. The competition level for that one is probably, uh, as far as America goes, between AA and AAA. That's definitely better than like the Japanese independent leagues, where it's still below like the Japanese major leagues. But um, yeah, and then like the American Association, which I worked in, that's between single and AA, I would guess. And it just goes down from there. Like the bottom three that I mentioned are all rookie league equivalent, basically, or lower. <laughs> There's been a lot of controversy about aluminum bats. Mm -hmm. Do all do they all use wooden bats? Yep, all of them. Some of them, like the Pecos League, they're a higher altitude. They actually use harder bats, which means that almost every team hits like 350 as a team. <laughs> you, you don't go there if you're a pitcher. <laughs> we just have time for like one more quick question. Oh boy, one more. Okay. Uh, it's just kind of interesting because there's not like an equivalent like for Major League Baseball. There's the MLB. There's not. Mm -hmm separate leagues, but for independent baseball, there's various leagues. Do teams ever play like between leagues? Interleague? Yeah. Um, that mostly happens between the American Association and the Can-Am League, but that's because they're, they're run by the same guy. So it, like, it's something like every other year, every two years, they'll play interleague. Um, they did two years ago. They didn't this last year. Um, with the new league that's coming up in 2018, that's started by a guy that runs a team in the American Association, and, and my guess is that they'll probably take the American Association teams in Texas and be their own league, but then they'll also play interleague from there. So, um, yeah, interleague does happen, but it's not b between every single league. All right, well, thank you, yeah. Sam. Thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs> uh, how does the competition compare to the international independent leagues and the major leagues in uh, Japan? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, there's a lot of difference in co level of competition in the independent leagues themselves in here in America. Um, and so when I was running through them, uh, there have been there like the estimation will vary on what like the equivalent is um, for the independent leagues. Like for instance, the Atlantic League. Um, this is sort of based on my estimation and what other people have said. I think like the Atlantic League, you'll have a lot of former major league players in there. The competition level for that one is probably, uh, as far as America goes, between AA and AAA. That's definitely better than like the Japanese independent leagues, where it's still below like the Japanese major leagues. But um, yeah, and then like the American Association, which I worked in, that's between single and AA, I would guess. And it just goes down from there. Like the bottom three that I mentioned are all rookie league equivalent, basically, or lower. <laughs> There's been a lot of controversy about aluminum bats. Mm -hmm. Do all do they all use wooden bats? Yep, all of them. Some of them, like the Pecos League, they're a higher altitude. They actually use harder bats, which means that almost every team hits like 350 as a team. <laughs> you don't go there if you're a pitcher. <laughs> Oh boy, one more. Okay. Uh, it's just kind of interesting because there's not like an equivalent, like for Major League Baseball, there's the MLB, there's not mm -hmm. separate leagues, but for independent baseball, there's <coughs> various leagues. Do teams ever play like between leagues? Interleague? Yeah. Um, that mostly happens between the American Association and the Can-Am League, but that's because they're, they're run by the same guy. So it, like, it's something like every other year, every two years, they'll play interleague. Um, they did two years ago. They didn't this last year. Um, with the new league that's coming up in 2018, that's started by a guy that runs a team in the American Association, and, and my guess is that they'll probably take the American Association teams in Texas and be their own league, but then they'll also play interleague from there. So, um, yeah, interleague does happen, but it's not b between every single league. All right, well, thank you, Sam. Thank you, everyone, for coming.